So what is Hitler's view on the USSR? Well, if you do a little research, you're kind of struck by the fact that he, his views are pretty well defined. They're not surprising. They're outlined in a book that he wrote while he was incarcerated after the Beer Hall push in 1924. He's writing away in prison, Mein Kampf. And he's outlining some of his angst about certain groups of individuals, specifically about the Slavic people. He's also very concerned about socialism and communism as he feels this is a rising tide of, of uh, problems. And he talks about this notion of Liebeschram, living room. Why are, why are the Germans so obsessed with living room? Why do they need space? Well, one of the elements that we have to look at is the, the increasing population of Germany and its ability to continue to feed itself as an independent nation. We probably have dismissed this now in the modern world where we go to the grocery store and you can shop for produce and you can go in one aisle and get 20 different countries worth of products. Everything from oranges from Argentina to, uh, I don't know, pineapples from uh, the Philippines and everything else. And you, know, you think this is a normal state of affairs. However, back in the 20s and 30s and 40s, the notion of independence meant that you had what? <coughs> the ability to produce enough to feed yourself, to sustain yourself. Nobody wanted to be inter interdependent. We've kind of relaxed that view. Today we can't find hardly a thing that we make anymore. We kind of decry. If you look for a shirt, you can't find the USA shirt anymore. You can almost think it's a, uh, a novelty by two of them. That wouldn't have been the case in this period of time. Strength is viewed by independence. Ability to produce, not only agriculturally, but industrially. And this is something that Hitler has on his, on his plate. And eventually we're going to see, beginning in 1940, this idea of the concept of the new order, which is going to be a racial component. Now notice that he doesn't believe very much about are very well about the uh, Slavic folks. This idea of inferiority. He calls them untenmenschen, under people, inferiors. Why are the Slavs viewed as inferiors? Because they're direct competitors to whom? Germany. They possess some of the better land to the east. They're a growing concern. And Hitler realizes that this is not the Russia of old, this is now the Soviet Union of new, which, do, which does things in a different fashion. Clearly, if you're looking at the, the lay of the land, through the 1930s, Stalin is on a rapid industrialization program. Forced five-year plans, changing the economy of the Soviet Union so it can produce industrial products, collectivization of farms, and how does he deal with dissent? He sends people away, kills them, and he's not apologetic about any of this. He really leads through a very brutal style of leadership. It's not this is not just an easy deal. He forces his will on people. And likewise, this is almost like a reign of terror, almost reminiscent of a previous time in history, like the French Revolution, where people are fearful to really say what they feel or to act on what they feel. Because you have a person that is obsessed with power and has the mechanism for power. Remember that in this particular case, Stalin has risen through the ranks representing what? Segment of the Communist Party. The, no, the proletariat. Well, he's not the proletariat. He's representing the Communist Party leadership. 
whereas the other element was controlled by Trotsky, who was in charge of the Red Army. Well, what happens to Trotsky by 1929? He's forced him out of the country. Trotsky is still alive in 1939, 1940. Does anybody know where he's hiding out? Mexico. Mexico. And he's assassinated by, allegedly, the secret police, the Soviet secret police. Pick axe to the head. Okay? Because he's still writing from afar, criticizing whom? Stalin. Stalin. So you've got a guy that's very insecure in his power base. So based on these views, Hitler feels that Stalin is a pushover. This guy is a pushover. The main reason why he feels he's a pushover, 1938, Stalin fears that the army is going to uprise against him, the Soviet army. And what does he do? Cleans house. Three of the five marshals, which are the highest rank, he has them executed. Trumped up charges. In one case, he collaborates with the Germans to manufacture evidence that the guy was a traitor. One day trial. Started at 9 o'clock in the morning. By 2.30, they were, they were hanging him. Okay? For those of you that are lawyers, I'm sure the discovery process was working well there that day. Right? <laughs> Interviewing witnesses was probably real uh, high on the list. 13 out of 15 commanders, which are equivalent to like our one-star generals, were executed. So who's left? He's pretty much decimated his military leadership. And what does he proceed to do? Select people that are going to be favorable to him. Why will he select people that will be favorable to him? He's fearing possibly a coup. He thinks the army might rise up on him. Not a good student of history, because how many times has the, the Russian army ri risen up against its leaders? Once, and it lasted for a day, 1825. Okay? So he's really focusing his attention on the what? The wrong place. So he's decimating his military. And Hitler feels that, hey, this is going to be an easy guy. He's not going to have commanders to command his troops. The other thing he's going to understand is that Germany, to this point, and you talk about hubris, their actions have only dictated what? They had light casualties and had heavy success. Everywhere they've gone, with the exception of Crete, the losses have been very minimal. And the Creek campaign was only 4,000 dead paratroopers. <coughs> so this has not been something that he's had to deal with. It's kind of like the kid that's been on a roll. We can keep winning. It doesn't make any difference. Whatever we touch, we're golden. And that's going through his mind. And the other flawed concept is if he defeats the, the Russians, the USSR... Who's left? Britain. Well, is Britain going to be able to do anything? They're all bottled up. They'll probably end up suing for peace. So in the back of his mind, he has to launch a lightning strike. He can campaign. It's got to take no more than six to eight weeks to do this. Just similar to what he did in France. If he can get that to happen, guess what? Everything will be golden. And then the final thing... The Germans have begun to run out of oil. Oil keeps those tanks going. And you know it's gasoline that pushes those vehicles along. Where is he getting his gas? Well, he just recently acquired Poloesti, which is the Romanian fields. But that's not a good situation. He needs backup. Why does he need backup? Because we're getting too close to being bombed by the uh, Brits and others. He's getting nervous. It's not a good situation. Where is there more oil? Baku, which is in the Caucasus, 
So if we get into the Soviet Union, there's another oil field. We'll be able to relieve our energy problem.